turn to Martin. Uh, Martin, you wrote a book about who owns poverty. The title itself provokes many questions. What is poverty and who owns it? Can you share with us a few examples from your work on the poverty spotlight that practically manifests the main thesis from your book? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here in this um, extraordinary year and uh, really a uh, ripe time to rethink everything we, we know about development. Poverty was defined as lack of money. And we have learned uh, with the International Labor Organization when they came up with the basic human needs and with UNDP, when the UNDP came with the um, Human Development Index, that poverty is more than lack of money. But now we live in the fourth industrial revolution and technology has changed everything. So now we no longer have any excuse to consult in real time with people living in poverty, what is their perspective? Um, up to now, uh, we have thought that it was the responsibility of society, that it was the responsibility of the government and of international development organizations like UNDP to <clears throat> formulate uh, a strategy to overcome poverty. Even the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals were um, constructed by experts. But there are two types of experts. There are two types of decision makers in development in general and in poverty in particular. Decision makers at the top and decision makers at the household level. The mom, the super mother, she is the big decision makers on whether the children brush their teeth and whether the children are vaccinated or whether the children have a place to do their homework, of whether they will uh, finish school or hang out with the wrong crowd and with bad friends. So there are uh, decision makers in the Ministry of Health who promote proper nutrition. But there's also the head of the household, and I repeat, usually a super mom, a super mother, who is a big decision maker. So we should understand that perspective is rationality. And we should listen to the, um, the voices of the people uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. We should also count the population of the world differently. The world does not have 7 billion people. The world has 1.5 billion family households. For people to overcome poverty and to reach development, you have to take a, 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 in consideration the basic unit of society, which is the family household. You cannot get a child out of poverty if her mother is chronically unemployed, and you cannot get a worker out of poverty if his children are not vaccinated. It's, the, it's the, the family unit. And of course we can, and human beings do not live independently as 7 billion um, units. We have to recover the role of the family. And here, uh, uh, there are many types of families, but people who eat and sleep under the same roof, that's what we would consider a family household. Thank you so much. Your work, definitely points to a need for a multifaceted, multidimensional approach to addressing deprivations and poverty, where, for example, the ability to manage one's emotions is as important as one's access to clean water. It challenges what it means to be an expert on poverty and points to equal merit of the person experiencing it, as well as the person studying or building policy to address it. From your experience, what will it take to transform the way we tackle poverty? Well, as I say, um, we, use, we need to use a simple phone device to allow people to just looking at images, measure their own poverty. And we should move away from an exclusivity of using indexes. Indexes aggregate data for decision makers at the top. 
but we need to have what I'm sure I'm going to show you here, which is a dashboard where a person, any person in the world can indicate where they are yellow, poor, where they are red, ultra poor, and where they are green. So we should move to a family um, dashboard and we should also move to a family development plan. What are my priorities? Why I don't have it? What am I gonna do to have it by what time? We started with national development plans. Then we moved to state and regional development plans. Then we moved to municipal development plans. I developed the municipal plan for Asuncion, Paraguay. Now we have technology to have one family development plan for every family in the globe. We can very easily have 1.5 billion family plans. And why do we know we can do that? Because everybody has Facebook, everybody has cell phones. So why is it easy to provide cell phones to the population of the world and not software and technology to allow them to um, um, self-diagnose, develop a dashboard, develop a plan, and also develop an inventory of proven solutions and strategy. There is a way in Northern Nigeria to access wheelchairs. How do we know that? Because there are people in Northern Nigeria who are very poor and who have uh, wheelchairs. There is a way to live in a family-free, uh, violence-free home in a slum in Brazil. How do we know that? Because there are places in the slums that are very peaceful. So I am very encouraged that the fourth industrial revolution and um, that is being proposed by the World Economic Forum and the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship can uh, uh, bring the power of technology for decision makers at the household level and completely change the way we have been thinking about constructing the sustainable development goals because you know what, between you and me, Nobody understands the sustainable development goals because they are too abstract. What does it mean habitat? Is it, do, do we sleep in the same bedroom or do children sleep separate from the parents? Do we have a proper bathroom? Do we have a refrigerator? Do we have furniture? So let's disaggregate these, um, in the development uh, indicators and let's personalize them and like in first person, you know, I know my rights. I know how to petition authorities. I take care of my family. And so um, with that, we bring it home and we um, incorporate billions of people into the fight to eliminate poverty in the world in the short term, short term, five years. There is nothing in poverty that cannot be addressed short term if you disaggregate it and put it from the family perspective. We, can, we have the methodology to increase family incomes. We have the methodology to promote savings. We have the methodology to educate a 10 year old girl from South Africa. We have we, we, everything, all the solutions are already there. The only problem is that they are not in one place. And of course you can have that inventory of solutions in the cell phone, but we also, nobody can do it alone. So we have to develop a um, um, mentorship program, a support system to accompany the homeless living in Southern California the formerly incarcerated African-Americans in New Orleans, the people living in the demilitarized areas of Colombia, the um, uh, young Armenians who are trying to develop their own micro, micro enterprise or the street vendors in, in India. I am very encouraged that we have the solutions if we are a little bit more humble and realize that in New York or in London 
um, we will only have 50% of the solutions. The other 50% of the solutions are not only in the governments of the global south, but also at the head of the household. And by the way, there are people in France, there are people in, um, in the United States or in Germany who are maybe poorer in some areas than other people living in Southern Italy or in, in uh, Venezuela. So um, it depends on who, who owns poverty. That's why I wrote this book, Who Owns Poverty, that explains that um, uh, it depends on whose perspective you're talking. And it's very beautiful to, uh, to allow the perspective of the homeless person in Los Angeles. What does she think? And so, um, as I say, we have the technology to uh, make this happen. And finally, Martin, your work also showed that changing the unit of analysis from individuals to households changes both what we see, where and how to intervene, and how the relations in the community change. Can you give us some examples of how this plays out? Ideally, some examples from private sector companies as well that work with Poverty Spotlight. Um, Many times governments think that the country is comprised of people. Yes, we are people, but we are individuals and part of a collective at the same time. Everybody is unique and part of a group. And that basic group is, is the family household. People who live and uh, eat and sleep under the same roof. Um, changing that perspective makes development much easier. Take the United Nations. They have a, an agency for children. No, yeah, beautiful. Um, but what does that statistic on children mean? Where are the mothers? Where are the fathers? So it has to, it has to for the, for the uh, work with children to be sustainable, you need to incorporate the whole family unit. And it is not that difficult. Um, so, you know, so there are many, many units of analysis. For example, we are working on, on, on with, a, with, a, with a more than 140 uh, corporations to do a uh, capitalism without poverty. In this specific cases, business without poverty. And we have companies who have committed to zero poverty with other workers. And Talking to these employers, it, it, initially we were we were afraid because we said, you know, if if we found out that um, our workers were were living in poverty, we thought that it was going to be our responsibility to do something about it and increase their salary. But it happens the other way around. The workers and their families get their act together, make their plan, and of course the company can help them. So we have more and more private sector companies in Paraguay, in South Africa, in the UK. Uh, we're talking to many companies in the United States, in Argentina, who are thinking about business without poverty. And, um, you know, the World Economic Forum is talking about um, stakeholder capitalism. And we say, yeah, stakeholder capitalism without poverty. And um, uh, poverty is, is, if you disaggregate it, and you make it into small pieces that are understandable by the mother of the house, there are very few things that cannot be accomplished. Second, we're working also with the church, a Catholic church in parish without poverty. Because one thing is to love the poor and to have a preferential option for the poor, but we, we need to empower the poor to graduate from poverty. That's why we're also working with the food banks. We're here in Paraguay, we're working with food banks. When people come to the soup kitchen and they take the food, at that moment, it's a beautiful opportunity to, to ask the woman, excuse me, do you have five minutes so that we can work on your plan to graduate from the food bank? Why are you coming to the food line? Is it a lack of employment? Is it a problem of family violence? Is it a problem of COVID? Because depending on why the person goes to the food bank, we can find a different solution. So um, I think that we, 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 we can um, have a more integral approach. Um, 
I think that we can work with, with uh, agency and self-efficacy and empower, empower people to, yes, we can. So, so much of what we heard today is about tailoring and adapting our responses to peoples and places. There clearly is no universal recipe for change. However, sitting right beside adaptative strategies are disruptive strategies, how to change behaviors in Paraguay, how to build political coalitions in Freetown, how to envision a future that signals planetary and social boundaries, and how to pull all of this together in policy, programmatic, and institutional responses in Colombia. While most of our development attention focuses on the present, and rightly so, we should be mindful that the future is already here, but perhaps not evenly distributed. That is, we can see glimpses of the future in pockets of change and disruption, but we need to keep an eye out for tipping points and systemic change. I'd like to conclude by thanking all of our speakers for their forward-looking and inspiring work for creating insights into alternative development models. This is how change happens. Thank you so much for your kind attention and please stay tuned for the live Q&A.